James Harding, uh, I'm the editor of Tortoise, and I want to say welcome, thank you to those of you who've got a depth of knowledge and expertise for coming and joining us this morning. I wanted to tell you a little bit about how Tortoise works and what we're doing before we get stuck into the, the, morning, of, the morning of discussion. Um, uh, I'm Jewish and my favorite Jewish joke is about the two people who go to a restaurant, two Jews go to a restaurant, and one says to the other afterwards, what did you think of, that, of it? And the one says, the food was terrible. And the other man says, yes, I know. And the portions were so small. And, and that reality of being able to complain both about the quality and the quantity of the food at the same time <laughs> feels to me a brilliant comment on all of us really, but in the context of a morning's conversation about quantum, where two things can be true at the same time, uh, the food's terrible and the portions are too small, um, feels to me particularly appropriate. And the reason I say that is, there's a thing if you're a journalist, and I've got colleagues from Tortoise and from other places here this morning, is that there are two things that drive you, I think, as a journalist. One is the thrill of finding things out, and the other is the fear of being found out. Right. And this morning, <laughs> I'm feeling both of those things in equal measure. But we've the reason we put this together and the reason we've tried to bring people all into our newsroom, and this, by the way, is our newsroom, all the tables are next door. Norm you're sitting where the, uh, the audio podcast and investigative teams normally sit. The reason we've cleared things out and tried to say, let's get everyone in the newsroom, is that we, we've got a really clear project in mind which is an attempt to create a quantum reporting project a quantum journalism project but the truth is we don't know what that is right it's not just that we don't know what quantum is but we really don't know what if you like the quantum reporter is or the quantum reporter should do so our aim today is to try and answer the questions we've got with quite genuinely a set of questions. We'd like to come away from this morning's conversation with a sense of, all right, if we set ourselves some questions for 2023, what would they be? And also for us quite specifically then, how would we do that? Between a newsletter and a podcast and a magazine and a forum, how could we create something? And sparing his blushes, Ilias Khan was the inspiration for all of this. Um, I. Uh, sat down at a uh, conversation in the summer hosted John by Bank of America and it was one of those brilliant moments Ilias well it, you won't think it was brilliant but it was brilliant for us where we started with a simple question what is it and suddenly a whole world of questions opened up and I contacted you afterwards and I said can we uh, can we do more? How can we understand this better? He said, well, you can understand it better if you go and read Helgoland, right? So that weekend, I bought the book Helgoland, and I read it. And actually then totally changed my view of everything, because I thought, instead of seeing a kind of new aspect of the economy, it was almost like I was seeing a new aspect of humanity, of art, something quite beautiful, and, and it changed my whole view of the whole thing. All of which is to say, though, some people know what they're talking about, and some people don't. So will you, will you allow for stupid questions and for, could you slow down and explain that again? Will you also allow for the way we do things at Tortoise, which is we don't do panel discussions. The aim is that this is like, essentially like, I don't know whether you've ever seen the movies, like an editorial conference or a leader conference where you're trying to figure things out. You can interrupt at any time. You can do that rudely, i.e. journalistically, you just interrupt, say, no, sorry, hang on, that's, I'm not sure that's right. Or you can do it politely, um, what I'll say is, I don't know enough about science. Is science this quite polite? Quite polite. Scientifically, just sort of raise your hand and I'll bring you in. But the aim is, through the course of the day, to hear from everyone and go, okay, well, let's really zone in on what we think those key questions are. The, uh, the sort of, the, the, the qubit at tortoise that we've got is Luke, right? And Luke Bedema has been the person who's brought us all together. I know that some people are going to have to get up and leave or come back during the course of the morning. Just be extremely relaxed, treat it as your own newsroom, come in and out. But what I, the end, I hope, is that between Luke and I, who are going to 
kind of try and steer things through the course of the morning, at the end of the morning, we'll come together and go, okay, here's what we think are the sort of sensible questions that we take away from this. And that we'll then come back to this group and say, here's the quantum project we're hoping to go for in 2023. What do you think of it? Does it make sense? Or did we really not understand? We started out not understanding, but now we really don't understand. Mm -hmm. So, Ilias, can I start with you? People, a number of people personally know Ilias here, but if you don't know, uh, Ilias is the CEO of Continuum and, and actually, as I said, is sort of our inspiration for this whole endeavor. Do, do you have a clear sense of what you think the questions are we should be thinking about? No, um, <laughs> but I do know. But I do know that um, as we sit here today and as we think about the next, I don't know what's a reasonable period of time that we can get our minds around three years, two, three years. I think that the likelihood is that as far as business and industry is concerned, and finance, and you know all the things that affect us the quantum computing industry is likely to have a greater impact on all of those things and make us rethink what, um, you know, are pretty deeply held presumptions. And, you know, this has happened many times over the last two or 3,000 years, but this is happening whilst we are alive. We don't have to read about it. And therefore, if there is, from your perspective, um, an expertise in explaining things, analyzing things carefully and without haste, and without judgment, then I think that is a pretty significant gap for what will be, uh, in my opinion, and the opinion of many governments, the biggest industry that there could possibly be. And the reason I can say that with confidence is that every economy, every government of consequence, China, Japan, the United States, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Germany, I could go on and on, has a national program around quantum technologies. It never happened before. A single technology has governmental programs, and often governmental programs that are very well funded, that are not compromised at a time when everything else is being compromised, which are multi-year which engage lots of departments. And quite often, particularly in the United States and China, and Germany, I should say, bring in the largest um, corporate organizations. So that confluence of opinion and weight and money and resources has never happened before. And the only thing I can think of that's remotely similar is the Manhattan Project. Mm. And even that wasn't, you know, we, we think of it in today's money and we think it was a lot of money. It was a drop in the ocean compared to what's happening in quantum. So they're either all wrong <laughs> and you can join them um, or you can start providing, uh, this is what you and I chatted about over dinner at Waddesdon, you can provide them with what I think is a much needed opportunity to just understand that this is happening and they're sitting there having their cornflakes and not realizing. And, and Elise, what do you do about the, I can see sort of, I can see three communities of people having quantum conversations. I can see scientists having quantum conversations, physicists having quantum conversations. I can see governments and businesses having conversations and then I can see the public having a conversation uh, and at this stage sort of in, let's say 2023 what do you think those three different conversations are what what are the questions that preoccupy those different groups well i think the fairway is narrowing right so i think there is a um let's call it an informed consensus so the commonality between the three sets would be a discussion about the timing and nature of the impact of quantum computing and quantum technologies on the things that we care about. Now, the different constituencies might have different things that they care about. The one thing they all care about at the moment is security, for obvious reasons. 
my view on that, as you know, James, is that in 50 or 100 years time, nobody's going to give a tinker's toss about whether we add a new algorithm to protect our, I don't know, our secrets. Um, we should care now, but in 50 or 100 years time, that's not what will matter. What will matter, and I'll just give you three examples which are likely to happen certainly within 10 years. You know, 10 years is actually shorter than the London Olympics. Um, I happen to think it'll be between five and seven years. Um, nitrogen fixation, so that's the fertilizer problem. So we spend about 4% of the world's energy on creating fertilizers that do all kinds of things to the soil as well as our bodies. I think that'll be solved. I think that carbon sequestration, which ought to be a preoccupation for every single one of us, regardless of our political persuasion. And the third one, which you and I have talked about before, which is harder to put your finger on, and I note that Luke's got this intriguing session about language. I think, I don't believe in sentient machines, that's just not me, but but I do think that devices, machines, computers, that will understand language in the same way that we are understanding each other, which has never happened. I mean, these expensive, opaque, non-accountable, and quite often corrupt systems, and I use the word corrupt with a capital C, for language processing, which is no more than text to speech recognition. But moving from that to a paradigm where devices understand language in the same way you and I understand each other right now, nuance, sarcasm, humor, will come into play. So if you think of those three things, and then you align them to the question you asked me about what people are asking, it, it, it really, and the reason why so much resource and geopolitical effort is being put into this, is an attempt to, on the one hand, be aware knowledgeably about the timeline and the impact. And secondly, as far as governments are concerned and large organizations are concerned, being at the leading edge as opposed to following, because everybody's seen over the last 500 years, and particularly the last 75 years, what happens when you're not at the forefront of technologies. And I'll finish on two points. Um, for those of you who understand what China's all about, they need no convincing that the reason that for the last, I don't know, call it 150, 200 years, they have been the victims of, let's just call it colonialism, is because of a lack of technological advancement at the time that the last industrial revolution came around. And they are convinced that they will not be left behind this time and that they will be the leaders in quantum and that they're the ones that will exert influence. And this is not something which is trivial. And if you contrast that with, I don't know, what's the biggest company in the world nowadays? Is it, apart from Aramco, Microsoft, I guess. I could have said Google and I could have said Apple. Yeah, well, Apple's just as apt. So Satya Nadella said last year, not this year gone, last year that Microsoft faces an existential risk if they don't become quantum ready. Their quantum program started in 2004. For seven of the last eight years, Google's biggest spend has been on quantum. It's not on spectacles and autonomous cars and on quantum. So, 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 so then, it is, to, to take, will you just take one of those examples that you got, the carbon sequestration example, mm -hmm. right? And just go, because I'm now stuck a little in Helgoland. <laughs> I'm, I'm in this sort of philosophical, it's a thing of beauty, what's the nature of reality? How do you get from, from that to the, the progress that you need to see in science to the application of real world problems to the investment required partly because we had a conversation last week where what was really striking about carbon sequestration is in the last two years it's gone backwards right, globally so so will you just sort of take well, that well, apart it's gone, for us? it's gone backwards because well, well well we haven't treated oncologies we've i mean there are many many things that are intractable 
or have been intractable for us because the technology that we use, these computers are contrived things. They use something called first order logic that we came up with, you know, um, depending on how far back you want to go, Frege or Bertrand Russell or Whitehead and others like that set this system up that Turing and Shannon and the various people involved, but maybe if we want to pick on one, we pick on Turing. And he understood that if you manipulate first order logic and you use something called the law of the excluded middle, which is you're either going to have a definitive A or a B, a left and a right, a one or a zero. If you do that, you can manage information. And when you manage information, you can do things more effectively, efficiently, and more quickly according to an algorithm, which is basically just a way of manipulating symbols. But nevertheless, let, let's stick to that. And that has become our paradigm. We built these transistors that are uh, well, vacuum tubes and then transistors which allow us to manipulate information. Well, of course, that's not the nature of reality. Reality is continuous. Right? So my conversation, the sound that's coming into your ears is continuous. We have a problem measuring continuous things when they get smaller and smaller. I mean, we're quite good at looking at big things. Um, you know, I can see this cup and I know, well, whatever this is, this, this jug, I won't drop it. But if I did it, a smash and the water would come out and we can predict these things. But when we get to the point of invariance, so what is invariance? What, what is it that unites us all? Whether it's that jug or whether it's my fingernail, then we get to the atomic level. And the laws that govern how atoms and subatomic particles react with each other and what they do with each other, I, I refer to that as the nature of reality. At that level, the laws are very different. Um, the distributive law, for example, in, if for those of you who are mathematicians, actually, well, we won't go in there. So, so, so there are many, many things we take for granted that just don't work at, 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 at that atomic level. So 40 odd years ago, 50, well, this goes back a long time. I mean, you could go back to Democritus and <laughs> even Plato and Aristotle. Um, but if you go back into, just to answer your question now, if you go back to about the late 1970s, and the early 1980s, four or five people, and probably more, but, but four or five people that we now recognize because it's documented that they did this, Richard Feynman being one, Yuri Manin being another, um, came up with the idea that if we're going to do things which simulate a, a quantum system, we need a quantum approach. Now, why would we care about quantum systems? So I'll give you one example. So if you said to me that I want, here's all this carbon floating around, and I want to capture it, and then I want to store it. But what I don't want to do is just bury it. And it doesn't actually go away, it's still there and actually gets worse because it interacts with other things and it will blow up, if not in, in literal terms and figuratively. If I already know what the problem is, how can I create a material in the same way everybody's familiar with aspirin, right? So let's create an aspirin that solves the problem, not of a headache, but of, a, of carbon sequestration. If we know what the problem is, how do we then start at first principles and at a molecular and a submolecular level, design this thing so it doesn't blow up. Our computers, I mean, you could, you could link up every computer that exists on the face of the planet, and it would not solve that problem. If we could, we would have solved it by now. So Feynman famously um, wrote about this, and I think it was 1981 that it was published, and he outlined how if we, instead of having bits, there was actually a guy called John Wheeler, who was a very amazing scientist um, about a decade earlier, who'd come up with this idea. But Feynman said, if you can manipulate information embedded in the physical things that are subatomic particles, electrons and photons, then you have a chance at not facing the problem that we have if you embed information in transistors on and off. 
I mean, they subsequently become magnetic bits to store the information at that time. That's how they did it. But if you did one rather than the other, suddenly you're not constrained. And the best example I have, and I'll pause after this because it gets really interesting after this. But the best, exam the best example I have is all of you will have heard about the parable when this magnificent creature over here that's a king and I'm a humble peasant and he, he you know I solve a problem for him he says oh you can have whatever you want and I say whatever are you, are you sure and he says yes and I say I tell you what there's a chessboard over there I want as much rice as there might be if you double the grains of rice on every board right the 64 so all of you know the story so by the time you get to about is it 32 I think some mathematicians in the room there's, there's not enough rice in the universe, right? So this is the power of exponentiation. You can't do things like that that require that power of compute on a computer. You, you need a quantum state and for reasons that we, we, we don't need to go into. And that discovery, or that, I don't want to call it a discovery, that realization in the 80s led to a very brilliant scientist called David Deutsch who's still alive in Oxford, converting that into a computing paradigm. And that led rise to the invention of what we now call quantum information theory. And the journey from about 1980 something to now has been one where we have tried and tried and tried through a combination of scientific breakthrough and engineering breakthrough to create and build a computer that is a quantum computer where the bits of information that are required are embedded or represented by qubits instead of bits, which are either atoms or subatomic particles, most often an electron or a photon. And whereby using these systems, now coming back to your question about carbon sequestration, if we know what the properties are, of the material that we want to build, we can now start to build that material. And the great thing is that this is not science fiction. Earlier this year in February, a French company called Total Energies, which is a large hydrocarbon extracting organization, which has been working on carbon sequestration for many, many decades, working with a quantum computing company came up with the magic formula and now we're waiting for the machines to catch up and it is likely it is highly likely that this problem will be solved and for those of you who really want to knock yourselves out there's a website called archive a r x i v and if you tap in as you all have machines right in your hands now total energies carbon sequestration archive you will find the scientific paper that describes this. And not only that, the algorithm exists. So this is, this is why governments are doing what they're doing. This is why we all should care. And where you, you may notice there are quite a few people tapping that in right now. <laughs> and if I had mine, I would. Uh, Elias, what do you do? And by the way, weigh, weigh in. Please don't be shy. P please do. You've got much better th thoughts and questions than I do for, 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 for Elias. Um, so with that in mind, you know, we, we call this the Responsible Quantum Summit, partly, I think, because journalistically, we go in at all of these things interested in power, interested in how do you either use power or abuse power? That's often the kind of central question. And with, with AI generally, but with quantum, I suppose, at a kind of supercharged level and an exponential degree, there's the kind of Robocop Terminator question. Are we signing up for something that can radically improve the way in which our societies work or is going to get out of control and is going to be dangerous in its disruptions? And how do you think about that problem? So I think it's even more important than anything that we've discussed so far. And um, so I'm an optimist, some Lancashire. And you've got to be optimistic, right? <laughs> and... Uh, you know, joking aside, you know, my, um, I mean, not ask me this question, but I, 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 not only an optimist, but also emotionally driven. You know, we grew up in grinding poverty. And um, 
And I have great faith always in the positive. And so I do believe that we, all of us, so I wrote an op-ed on this, if you really want, in Scientific American, it's open access, you can have a look at it. And it goes into more detail in what I'm about to say in two sentences. We were asleep at the wheel in the mid nineties when the internet came along. Those of you who were still yet to be in your mid thirties don't count. The rest of you, no, in this, in this, I know, I know. Yeah. we enjoyed the sentence. But we, we really, those of us who were older, we fucked up big time and we pay the price. I have children and whenever I see them doing this, I have nieces as well. I die. I do not know. I can't, I don't have the words to tell you how fearful I am. Uh, uh, we did this, James, you and I did this. We didn't give a fuck. And we make excuses. I met somebody yesterday um, who shall remain nameless. And we talked about the Millie, what the late, yeah. the little the Millie Dowler case. And he was, oh no, well, this, that, the other. I showed him the door. I didn't want to know. We, there are no excuses. Now, I don't think that's going to happen with quantum. I think that the people who matter are the people who today are less than 35 and who do care. And they're not scared of determining what's right and what's wrong. And I think that what I can do and what we can do is make sure that we don't pass this by. And so my short answer is a very long answer as well. But my short answer is that we should ensure that we democratize this we must make sure that it's not just London and Accrington, I'm from Accrington, that benefits, London will and Accrington will, but I don't know, you know, whatever the capital of Burkina Faso is, and Calcutta, and Manila, and so that, and, 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 and I think the democratization of this, sorry, is possible, because actually, I don't know how my car works, I don't know how the phone works, what we mustn't do is hide behind the mystery of the science because that's fine it's actually there are many 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 hundreds of thousands of people who can handle this and instead of wasting time trying to tell people how it works i don't i don't know how penicillin works i don't know how aspirin works but what i do know is the impact it has and that is what we should focus on. But, but, but can I just challenge you on that? Because I'm really nervous about this, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really nervous about it for exactly the reason you say. So mm -hmm. I think I began to understand what phones, social media, the quote unquote democratic internet was doing to people. The consumer internet. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, I, but, but do you remember, do you remember f all the way through probably the first decade of this century, mm -hmm. the argument was this is an incredible force for empowerment and democratization and then probably in the second decade we all started saying hang on a second let's have a look at the impact that this this is having mm -hmm. and my my worry is that in in the case of ai generally but quantum specifically you're not going to see either the public or frankly politicians get to grips with the detail of this so that they they do put in place the equivalent of what you're talking about, which is, for all its faults, an FDA that does have some power over regulation I, and investment. I, yeah, so I wasn't going to go down that. Well, so we've got like three minutes. We've got three minutes. So, yeah, it, yeah. It, so, so we've got three minutes and I'll, I'll say them a bit. Yeah. And then let's have a, for those of us who should be interested, this is a much bigger conversation. And actually, this answers a question as to why you should have the journal or the podcast or whatever it is, you, we, we need this. No, look, I mean, I think traditional journalism was accountable. So if you wrote or printed something in the Times that said Ilias Khan's a dick, I would have sued the Times and there's nowhere to hide. And the biggest problem, the sleight of hand that took place, the daylight robbery, the crime that took place is when consumer oriented organizations monetize data whilst not being accountable and if any of you have ever tried on instagram or facebook to complain or yeah. get somebody to listen it, you can't and, and that's what happened with millie dowler as well and so that then accentuated things but there was so much money being made that people were paid it was their interest to tell us it was good silicon valley as one example made so many billions from this because it was commercialized at vast scales 
in a consumer environment. And these things then became cheaper and cheaper. But, but, here's a big but. Quantum computing is not controlled. Silicon Valley has missed this. Thank God. Right? My company is the biggest quantum computing company in the world. It is worth many billions of dollars. We have not a penny of VC in our firm. Not one penny. And I'll finish on this. AI, uh, this gentleman had a question. Please, please, please pay attention to this next thing. There is no such thing as AI. It does not work. It is unaccountable. It is vague. It is approximate. Most companies are grappling with how to use it. There's a lady here, Alex, whose job it is to help people understand how banks might use it. Where we confuse things, and we talk about things like AI in consumer-facing organizations, where we do pattern recognition and Netflix recommendations, that is not what changes lives. So that's just a quick comment on that one point. So you were going to say? You know, you talk about where it's going to come from. Mm -hmm. Oh, do we need it? Oh, wow. I'm not sure we need it. From point of view, I think, I think where it's going to come from is from a... Um, so know, would you just introduce yourself? Sorry, sorry Stephen Metcalf. Steve, um, I've got a small uh, quantum, uh, pure quantum tech investment fund. So um, we've got five portfolio companies invest in another uh, three or four over the next few months. But um, it's, it, the way it's going to come from, from a governmental point of view, is from a defence and security angle. I, I think um, what we'll see at the moment, up until 18 months ago, 70% of all patents that have been filed have come out of China. Um, the various governments are, I think, as, as you rightly know, um, are already standing up and realising that there is a big threat here and hence from a monetary point of view they are spending an awful lot now whatever it takes in a way uh, to play catch up um, so i see that um, the governments will are and are waking up uh, and you'll see i think certainly over the next short term the next 12 18 months from, certainly from the five eyes there's going to be an awful lot of money uh, coming through into the quantum industry um, so I dispute quite a bit of what you said, oh, okay, but, but, but let, no, no, that, I mean, it is what it is, right? Yeah. So, so my organization is the signatory to something called an NSA, which is National Security Agreement in the United States. We were the first organization that was subject to that in a quantum context. It's a test case. There are 14 agencies to whom we're accountable. Uh, the Department of Defense is a lead. Here in the United Kingdom, since 2015, we've been accountable to uh, GCHQ. Yeah. and the NCSC. So I think I have some sense of <laughs> one yeah. bit of the jigsaw, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think the genie's out the bottle. Mm -hmm. And I think the driver is no longer security and defense at all, in fact. Um, I think that the commercial application of quantum technologies in many other areas is far, far, far more interesting. Now, what I will say to you, which I think is the point perhaps you're making, we'll come back to regulation. I think the realization that existing forms of protection when it comes to cybersecurity are no longer valid in a quantum context has hit home with governments and rightly they're, they're concerned. And they're concerned for the NHS. I don't want my family's and your family's secrets to be out in the open. And that paradigm is the one that is driving some but by no means all of the of the issues. But this is a big, big conversation. I think just on patents, I'd be cautious on patents. Uh, and I say this with respect. I think the vast majority of what we do in terms of know-how often doesn't get patented. And the reason for that is patents typically don't always work in deep science, because by the time you claim a breach, 15 years later, yes, two later. Yeah. So it's different, like, you know, I invented this cup and it's got two handles and yours has only got one. Yeah, those things are easier, but when you get into deep science, it's very, very yeah. hard. And a lot of companies are working on stealth now with government yeah. patents because yeah. they're seeing, as you say, it, it isn't worth Correct. filing it. Is Correct. It? So, Especially yeah. when it comes to Correct. various jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah. I think we're, 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 we're going we're to wind up with one final point and then we yes. get one. I, I think, you know, sort of picking up and on... And so we'll just introduce uh, ourselves. Sorry, Stuart Woods, Oxford Instruments. I, I think picking up on what Steve said, I think one of the important points, which Ilias, you were sort of hinting at, is that quantum computing is really not what we're talking about. We, we created machines with our interpretation of what a machine should look like. 
I think with quantum, what we're doing is turning that around and asking nature, what would the machine look like or creating, letting nature create the machine. And I think that is beyond just uh, computing, that's sensors, that's networks, that's communication. And I think that's also what you're trying to hint at as to why governments are so interested, uh, I think, and, and why it's beyond just computing. That's a very, very good point. Um, I think metrology in its broader sense, so how we sense things, um, sound, um, sight, of course, um, telescopes and microscopes and radar. And I think the impact of quantum technologies on those is going to be as important. The, the reason I think there is a preoccupation at the moment with compute is the ability to design materials from first principles upwards, which solves many of the problems that actually matter to us as humans, whereas things in the met metrological sense are more to do with you know, autonomous cars, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I completely agree with you. I also think that the nature of engineering advances in quantum computing is dependent on advances in metrology as well. So I think the two are hand in hand. If I can, finish on one thing people for years always ask me how can i learn more how can i read a bit more how can i do it without my mind blowing up and at the time you and i met helgoland by carlo Rovelli was a recommendation and it is a beautiful book and it it's it, it, it is however about to be published next week is this book I've, this is a proof copy it's called quantum in pictures I don't think there's a single equation in it. This was originally a challenge for high school students, secondary school students, to be able to take an Oxford exam and beat Oxford students at quantum information theory and quantum mechanics exams, part three tripos. And they did. And that experiment then became this. This is also a very beautiful book. And the underlying methodology is called ZX, or if you're American, ZX calculus. And company after company after company who's involved in quantum has adopted ZX as the calculus by which they can manipulate information effectively to create quantum programs. Now, this book is not about quantum programs. This book will help anyone barber or whatever um, to get to grips with what quantum mechanics is and how quantum computing works on the back of that i can't remember when it will be published but i think it's in the next week and i'm pretty sure it'll be on amazon so it's called quantum in pictures um, and now the other thing is i'm a music person i love music and we talked about the impact on humanity so this was just published by Springer. Those of you who are involved in academic publishing will note that it's a fairly reputable company. I have a big problem with academic publishing. It's corrupt. But nevertheless, <laughs> well, it is. It is, it yeah, is. it is. Um, I mean, it's a medieval artifact. Anyway, so quantum does impact music. Um, it impacts everything. So this book was just published as well by Springer. Now, this, unfortunately, is about 78,000 quid. Um, but is there it? are some no, it's actually 109 quid. I mean, it should be worth four quid, right? But they charge 109. Um, but Sam is that copies of this are around. And if you happen to know my email address, you can actually email me and I might get you a few copies. Um, but 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 this is this is nothing. I mean, this was published for nothing. And this is very, 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 very good. But this for those of you who are into music is very good as well. By the way, can I just say I've taken Ilias's book recommendations before. That, 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 that's a great weekend you've got in front of you <laughs> doing, doing that. Um, Ilias, can I, say, can I say thank you? We're going we're gonna to go, yes. Luke's going to run this next session on shared language. Yes. But by the way, I know you've got to run. No, I'm not. Come I'm going to hang around. But I just want to say thank you to you because one of the things I was saying to Richard actually as we were just getting together is my experience coming as a journalist to areas of science is often science is understandably defensive because we don't know what we're talking about. You're incredibly generous in opening this up to us, so thank you very much indeed. Yeah.